Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode. In today's episode, I would like to speak about, in, I guess, in a very free way, about the concept of God and due to people on this planet who the concept of God is very, they have an emotional relationship with. Uh, For this episode, I am approaching it, let's say, through a theologian's perspective. I am wondering about the concept of God. (coughs) And in some sense, I am not making claims about what God is or has to be or is not. I am trying to open up the idea and I want to share certain insights I have. So wherever you are, welcome. For this episode, I finally got my notepad going. So to begin, when I ask myself, why do concepts exist? I find that they exist to be engaged. And so human beings should fearlessly explore the totality of creation. I know that in Abrahamic traditions, there's like phrases in certain, (coughs) in certain holy books where the idea goes as if the Creator has given you intelligence to use, right? As if there is a reason, there is an advanced capability of attention, at least from the religious perspective. So, So, I want the viewers to look at the screen. This episode is dedicated to to this statement. was a conceptual God and experiential an experiential tactic against existential fear. (coughs) 
by conceptual God, I am referring not to per se pantheistic notions of God, that means it's as if there was a sort of evolution of the concept of God towards the Abrahamic traditions. <clears throat> and then after the Abrahamic traditions, the concept of God was in some sense, un I would say, to some degree, like untouched. Something happened in the 6th century that, you know, the ancestors of many human beings on this planet, their, their lives and their destinies were taken by that event, you know. <clears throat> Sometimes when I look at religions and I think about the future, I think about in the future when there's, let's say, androids or let's say extraterrestrials land or something, like, are they going to become religious? Are they going to worship God? You know, <clears throat> are we going to see androids and aliens praying? Like, to, to what level is the destiny of the concept of God in the mind of man? <clears throat> but for this episode, the conceptual God, and please keep in mind, dear listeners, is episode is not intended uh, to be disrespectful in any way. I am just looking at the geometry of an idea and wondering about its implication. <coughs> the, concept, uh, <coughs> the conceptual God, I would say that it started from nature sort of being God and then in some sense as a specificate, uh, more specifically it's as if it went to in some sense objects I would say, I mean, nature, nature is like an event, right? But, 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 but I would say, okay, let's say it this way. We started from, you know, for example, rivers to, to in some sense, let's let them not say objects, but let's, let's say, for example, people worshipped rivers, you know, and like thirsty people worshipped rivers. <laughs> For example, you know, the Ganges River in, in Vedanta, it's like it has the goddess archetype, for example. Now, what I'm trying to say was it was like we were attributing truth as, as, a, as in some sense the, the source of the meaning of the moment. You know, people attribute it to nature, let's say. And then, in some sense, it became as if we can see in history how the rule of free will brought forth more of a sort of selection and sculpting process of what truth had to be for the individual, right? It's as if when we go really far back in history, a lot of life was happening unconsciously. At some point in this uh, evolutionary scheme, there suddenly came consciousness, right? And then this consciousness more and more, as if history is the journey of like an invisible controller in it in some sense in a, inside a game of manifestation you know <clears throat> some like right now what we look at the modern human being and we think it's like it's, it, you know to be normal is nothing but when you look at the, the, the journey of our species uh, to be honest achievements are not just physical states of mind are great achievements you know? <clears throat> everybody should be honored by it how far our species has evolved and is in some sense compared to all the other species on this planet to the top of the classroom you know it, it's like the human species is a you know straight a student you know what it, it feels he need, it needs to go beyond the classroom but let's say the squirrels birds you know wolves and lions it's like they're still you know you know at the back of the class Anyways, what I'm trying to get to is that consciousness came into the picture and when we look at the evolution of the psychology of, of the human being going from worshipping nature to then going to worshipping a specific selected component of nature, right? For example, somebody seeing a river and then somebody worshipping a statue they made or something, those are two different states of mind, do you know? <coughs> Pretty much what we are seeing in history is how free will has come to control uh, uh, how attention means anything. History is all about the emergence of the role of the emergence of the conscious self. So, from nature, 
worshiper. We went to specific idol worshiper. And then the Abrahamic religions, in some sense, Abraham made a huge entrance in history. <coughs> and he, in some sense, said that God is, in some sense, inconceivable and has no equivalent comparison in, in the manifest realm. Right, so what we're beginning to see it's as if what's the uh, closest thing to a sort of invisible, omniscient God, in some sense, the nature of how the mind is being the whole space. Really, what what the evolution of the psychology of religion is is identification with the body into recognition. It's like from a visible body, there is transitions. And stage is going towards a, 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 a sort of invisible mind turn. When the religions, the Abrahamic religions, presented themselves one by one, it was as if uh, you can say for the first time, truth was not just limited to the physicality of reality, but it was relevant to a subject of reality. That means from an objective position of an acceptance of truth, we went to, in, in some sense, a sort of idea worshipping, from idol worshipping into idea worshipping. <coughs> now, what is very interesting is that this is, this is the moment that I, I've been trying to paint to, in some sense, uh, unravel or open up this statement in the subtitle. And before I could do that, I have to say, in some sense, uh, share with the audience the difference between strategy and tactics. <clears throat> I would say I personally find myself, I don't know why, it's just I have this feeling, you know, that some part of me is, I don't know, I feel like I've been a strategist before this life or something, something of the sort. <clears throat> but when it comes to tactics, tactics is how the strategy goes about. That means somebody, let's say, knows what to do, uh, uh, but they, uh, excuse me, knows uh, where they need to go, but doesn't know how to get there. Tactics is how you get there. Strategy is where you're going. What is the ultimate outcome when forces collide? For example, Sun Tzu and the art of war makes a very important sort of metaphysical point that it's as if when there were two generals and they each had their own armies and it was like kingdoms were at war the general that was aligned with heaven right that means people don't realize it's a sun Tzu, the art of war is a, is a metaphysical book it's a transcendental book the strategist is considering different dimensions right as if that there is a sort of karma independent of the will of each general and the general needs to acknowledge how the moment is alive right this is pretty much the shamanic opening when life when the world to you is alive you can you can say you've become a shaman you know you have the shamanic perspective Strategy is destination, and tactics is, let's say, the transport, how we get there. Now, when I say, was the conceptual God an experiential tactic against existential fear? You see, guys, uh, I would say there was a point in my life where I realized that I can keep life simple. You see, there is, even though uh, George Orwell talks about ignorance is bliss, there are moments, I would say, of calculated and uncalculated, uh, uncalculated or conscious or unconscious ignorance, right? Unconscious ignorance is when the person doesn't know better, and conscious ignorance is when the person knows better, but they are not moving towards that. It would be as if somebody, they suddenly see something that scares them and they put their hands over their eyes, right? 
Not a lot of people on this planet, I would say, have tolerance for the conceptuality, the conceptual follow-up of manifestation. What that means is if, if suddenly an extraterrestrial will hypothetically teleport in, like in front of a person, the person would close their eyes or they would get shocked or, do you know what I'm saying? They would, they would go into a sort of state of fear, right? <clears throat> and the brilliant thing about fear is that fear is the furnace where the conscious, honorable soul in some senses is uh, made from from a sort of ancient fear we have, we have come to the courage of modernity. This is the remarkable achievement of humanity. That means are the kingdom of humanity poetically has been fighting off fear. And those who were capable of in some sense claiming in the moment that they were greater than their fear, they managed to get through it. But those who made the fear act like their God, in some sense, I mean, in sure, in Abrahamic religions, there's, they have the saying where they say fear of God is the starting of wisdom. Because in usually in religious narratives, I don't think people realize this, but in, in religious narrative, what ends up happening is that a, 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 a significance in the story of the context of the world renders and dissolves the individual will. Just like you put... Uh, Oh man, I don't think I remember the term. Those kind of tablets you put in, like vitamin C tablets, you put in water and they dissolve, right? Religion is, is something very similar, where the person starts off as a sort of bewildered beast in an individual cosmos and then begins to realize, or at least begin to fathom, uh, you can say, an invisible level to life, right? Now, my personal view is that religion, its validity is a metaphor for actually an existential scenario. It means there was a truth about the presence of existence, let's say, witnessed by the wise, and the wise were like, okay, how do we say this to people, right? And because people were people, they could accept the concept of a person or a persona. And when the concept of the persona from the microcosm was first attached to the macrocosm, that's when in some sense God did not, was not, was no longer a shape, but was the potential of all shapes at once. Right? It's like an energy field that is witnessing everything at the same time because it is the potential of the, uh, of how that, uh, uh, how, re how that reality manifests. <coughs> so, anyways, so what? So the picture I'm trying to paint so far, and what I'm trying to say is that the human psychology um, started off as a sort of unconscious uh, uh, creature, right, where the environment was moving us. Then there came, let's say, the advancements of the free will, and more and more we began seeing that God or truth or let's say the ultimate, cannot be something that in some sense changes, right? For example, in Abrahamic traditions, when they say, <coughs> uh, for example, when they say God has no partner, right? No equivalence, equivalence, you know, it's like, uh, <coughs> it's like nobody can be God in certain Abrahamic traditions. In Christianity, Christ uh, was technically God, right? And in other traditions, you can say uh, there's, uh, you know, variations. But what, but what I'm trying to say pretty much, right, is this notion that man's mind could acknowledge beyond an object, so it moved on into subjects being truth. A subjective truth is in some sense like a glass container of, 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 of let's say, some sort of liquid, or it would be in some sense... <laughs> What I'm trying to say is that man's mind reached a point where it became an idea to itself and in some sense it began recognizing that, uh, how would I say, the creator position in the psychology of man pretty much went back into the unknown. Right? 
just like this idea that we did not create ourselves. It's as if like the realization of the free will that it did not start itself is kind of like the, that shift into the narrative of God. So when, when a, whenever a human being, like this is the cool thing, that uh, the most complex thing to study for human beings is themselves actually. How could the concept of God be a sort of experiential tactic against an existential fear? The existential fear is in some sense the unknown and it is the void in some sense. And what do I mean by this? That means this is something that ever since I figured it out, it's like like, like everything's become you know, very hilarious to me. <clears throat> that all of human knowledge is a reaction to emptiness and it's as if it, when energy didn't know what to do in the void it started to move. life is a reaction to an incredible meaninglessness right and this is why the meaning of life is created not per, per se by something outside of us but the meaning of it is created by us the potential of the reception of the phenomena that it's like the light enters our eyes and reflects into, in some sense, a, a narrative of meaning. We compartmentalize our memories through even narratives and story. Right? <clears throat> so the existential fear is pretty much when we were unconscious, there were no problems, pretty much like nature was moving without realizing it was moving. When consciousness came, nature realized it is moving and now it was the witness of its consequence. It's as if like, you know, the species woke up from a great slumber when it was asleep, it didn't notice the world changing, but suddenly when it noticed the world changing, and especially when it started to identify with the position of reality. we became conscious of the meaningless before we weren't even conscious of meaninglessness but we became conscious of the meaningless and meaning was our in some sense strategy and God was a tactic right and let me tell you why it was a necessary evolutionary tactic regardless of if it was divine revelation or not that's something that really nobody can have an opinion on because it is in the past right <coughs> I personally feel there is something going more going on on this planet than matter. But the concept of revelation, the concept of in some sense like, I don't know what kind of spiritual, per, uh, excuse me, what sort of, like I don't know how religious people would see me, but, but I'm a person who I feel that if God is inconceivable, the message is a, a fragmented representation of its being. That means imagine somebody sent you a text message and in the text message they said, okay, meet me at this location. Now, in that text message, right, imagine you don't go meet that person in the location, in, in the, in the location and instead you just worship the text message it's as if you forgot that it was a message and the words that came from a divine place began replacing the divine right this is why humility is one of the most important virtues and why pride is seen as a sin because of when a person is proud reality is solidified it is, it's, its boundaries are, are, are uh, accepted. 
but for a humble person, for someone who, who is just, in some sense, doesn't know anything, like the whole, all of knowledge stands to be known. People make fun of fools on this planet, not realizing the fools get to see uh, from a neutrality things that in some sense those who have claimed knowledge cannot. <clears throat> this has really been my personal challenge in these episodes, that in some sense I, uh, even though I give a talk and I, I attempt to, you know, to my fullest capability uh, to lower my, uh, my inner realms, but but I realize that it's as if there is more, there is more, there is more, and eventually it reaches the idea of infinity. And when it reaches the idea of infinity, there can be nothing more, right? So whether man has any sins or not, or he does good deeds, eventually reality will reach a point where it seems that the idea is not for this place to make sense. You see, rationality was post-existential activity. Experiential interpretation was post-existential activity. If you're a Buddhist or a yogi, technically it's a different story, but <clears throat> before stories, there was something here, something that beautifully was present, was present, the unknown presence of being. At the moment we began becoming mobile, we began identifying with uh, the conscious self. So, so the concept of existential fear, the concept of God, pretty much imagine you were alive in ancient times, imagine you are a simple farmer. Okay, you're not an educated person, you're a farmer in a village. Okay. You have been a farmer for years and then at some point you're growing old, let's say, and you're wondering, okay, what is this all about? What is this all about? As if the mind upon repetition begins to in some sense snowball effect its way beyond the repetition. As this sort of ancient farmer would suddenly imagine somebody comes and tells you, hey, someone who feels they have been, in some sense, trapped in a sort of meaningless loop, right? A meaningless loop of manifestation. There is this creator, there is an originator, there is an author to manifestation, right? And I could totally see <coughs> people, just, just the nature of the mind being something that it wants in some sense if there is a hidden door it wants to open it and see 
and so the nature of man's mind began considering uh, as a sort of let's say experiential tactic it used the idea of god to in some sense what would the term be to counter attack the incredible solitude of our existential position the incredible meaninglessness of it so in some sense the concept of god i could just envision so many human beings even kings queens right just people of the old world being like you know in some sense in times of trouble in times of emergency in times of chaos as if when they feel powerless there is a power greater than you it isn't like as if you feel like a kitten trapped in a box and suddenly something grabs you you know by the neck and pulls you out and that's what the concept of god was in some sense it was a hope a sort of retaliation a hopeful retaliation against how the how everything started meaninglessly <clears throat> so oh my god Pretty much, you know, we can say the concept of God is one of the earliest attempts to personify the unknown, to in some sense establish another type of relationship aside from, man, I'm just a creature in a meaningless landscape, you know, suddenly into a, a position where there is a meaning beyond our comprehension, right? <clears throat> uh, I don't know who it was, I think it was Jordan Peterson. You know, he was talking about addiction and he was saying how a lot of people who, let's say, they overcome their addictions, they actually have a sort of, uh, you know, trans, uh, you know, a psychological transformative experience or, or maybe, you know, psychedelic sort of experience, right? Where something about how they are keeping at the foundation, the center of the foundation of yourself, where they're at the axis of their self changes, right? And when it changes, it usually requires a power greater than itself, right? That means a lot of, let's say you're a secular person and you look at a bunch of spiritual people like praying, meditating, or you know, dancing or something, and you're like, what are these guys doing? On some level, it is man's mind which has recognized the sort of physicality which is being governed by a sort of invisibility of mind, right? Our personalities, we subjectively say they exist, but they are not visible, you know? A person is visible, but the idea of them is not visible. That egoic sense of self behind their eyes that pilots them or governs them is not visible. to go with this is that 
the concept of God could potentially be said to be one of the greatest strategies that somehow appeared. You know, one of the greatest strategies towards the development of the individual psyche, but at the same time, uh, in some sense, uh, one of the greatest counterattacks of mankind against a uh, sort of existential loneliness in the void. You see, we put on clothes, you know, we walk on our two legs, you know, we wear watches, you know. <coughs> buy hair gel, you know, <laughs> right, but really all of this, you know, is in, in some sense a sort of uh, occurrence and awareness. You know, it's as if like, it's like there's, like, you know, truth is like this a problem till the end of time. And it's like all the generations of people that are born, they're pretty much using the alphabet of what is accessible to them. You know, the information they have in some sense to state what it is, right? There's so, there has been so many different types of human beings that if all the human beings on the planet fathomed, you know, a sort of, they attempted to personify the cosmos, There would be, you know, as many gods as there are eyes. But the notion of all of it going towards the inconceivable, the idea that we noticed the visible dimensions, in some sense, we, we have lived as an animal. You know, the body lived as an animal, you know, The mind lived as a human and poetically, you know, what could the soul's life be, right? You know, I am a person who I would say this very straight up. I am considering there's a visible life, an invisible life, and an inconceivable life. I've written here, a creature in emptiness upon becoming conscious of its individualism <coughs> turned an empty world, turned the world into a hidden all-knowing mind. But I could also say that it's like we recycled emptiness emotionally and linguistically into a projected potential meaning of being. You know, sometimes I think that religions could be, you know, like time traveling moments. They could, they could be time, like future self interventions. That means if we, you know, this is my, I've talked about it in a lot of talks, but I'll say it here. If we consider that, you know, right now we're an individual object and the future is going to be something of a collective invisible field like nature. It, it's another way of saying if we're conceivable now and if the future is inconceivable, in some sense the future and in, in, inconceivable means it's another way of saying that which is not bound by the conceivable, excuse me, by the visible or the invisible. <clears throat> the forces that define us are really our relationship with the invisible.
so I guess that's kind of the explanation. What I'm trying to say is that the concept of God was a way of keeping the conscious mind, you know, fearless in the face of the unknown. Right? It's pretty much another way of saying the concept of God uh, uh, kind of raised the conscious of the individual. Right? I'll share a story I had heard that there was this man during a time where, what do you call it? Uh, pretty much <coughs> my grandmother was telling me a story about her father and she was saying that when her father was young her father had to take a horse and go and her father was from Baku this place called Baku <coughs> and her father had to take a horse ride for two days and uh, my grandmother's father, his father, the father, like my grand grandmother's grandfather, you know, gave my uh, grandmother's father, uh, what do you call it, a letter, and he had to go to the next town where his relatives were, show them the letter, but he had to ride alone. And there was a moment where he was in some sense good traveling, and he stopped by in the forest, and the way at least my grandmother says it is that there was this wolf this pretty much the guy sees a wolf and there's this sudden shock and my grandmother says that her father all he could do in that moment was he started shouting at the wolf you know god's name imagine you're in a life-threatening scenario you don't know what to do and all you could do is like shout at the one who you are considering created the whole thing it's as if if the world is alive you know it's like see me now hear me now that's just one example you know there's many moments in life where a human being will feel powerless right you know all those people who think that spirituality means everything is, is like peace all the time it's not that kind of peace you know the peace the, the, the enlightenment of the peace let's say the <clears throat> Satchitananda of the mystical notion is one where by getting rid of the idea of self everything is blissful but if there's an idea of self you know it's still conditional say the genius or the brilliance of the concept of God is that if we just say that there was a self in a world, by making the world the will of a greater self, of man with the meaningless but man with unknown meaning. Pretty much we turned the context of the empty into the context of the living. God is another way of saying the whole world is alive.
say a human being can be divided in the levels of the traditional view of the body. It's kind of like stale water, you know, leads to decay. So the concept of God was culturally passed down, right? And it was it was like an event. Like really, it's so fascinating when I think about the religions because nothing like that could happen now, <clears throat> uh, or at least to that level of just just pure acceptance, right? The mind has way more inform layers of information to consider through that. You know? you know, to me, sometimes I feel true, like true religious people, they want to in some sense, like if they had a time machine, they'd go back to the 6th century. You know? <clears throat> That's how true they want to stay to how when the ideology began. <clears throat> so, when I say the concept of God, in culture we have language. God is conceptual. And it's very fascinating because it's as if before language could there have been revelation, right? Like the idea could be that miracles predate holy books, you know? <laughs> you know, as if the holy, as if the revelation was a sort of miracle before the revelation defined the miracle, you know? So, on a cultural level, it was a cultural strategy. Now, if we wonder about what was, let's say,
I'd say prior to culture. There's other levels as well. Ultimately, it's unknown and unconsciousness. Evolution is like the opposite of George Cam uh, Joseph Campbell's uh, hero's journey idea, where it's from the known going to the unknown and then coming back to the known. But in reality, how consciousness emerged was from the unknown. You know, knowledge began becoming its own consideration. Like honestly. You know, it's not that I want to say, like, humanity is caught in a sort of lila or in a sort of feature of its own, you know, self-simulation, but really we're on a rock in the middle of nowhere, right? It's as if the meaning is being put into what to see, what we see by something that is within us, right? It's as if the capacity to acknowledge true, it, it's like its potential must exist within, you know, before it even happen, right? So... Before culture, we had nature, right? Which is an existential, which is existence. That means it's like ingrained. That means what is more, what has had more of an ancient influence on us than language was, in some sense, the laws of nature, right? The forces of nature, as if gravity was keeping us on the surface of this planet. Before there was even language to explain gravity, before an apple, you know, fell into Isaac Newton's hand as the concept of gravity. Literally, the concept of gravity fell into Isaac Newton's mind. You know how incredible is that? You know, it's as if the idea of gravity had a gravity in emerging in Isaac Newton's mind. gravity of the idea of reaching the awareness of Isaac Newton's psyche. psyche. But anyways, what I'm trying to say is the concept of God comes to culture, human beings have diff behaved in different ways, pretty much the idea is that meaning existed before language, and you know, right now, what is the common wisdom? You hear a lot of people say, you know, you know, don't talk the talk, walk the walk, right? They're saying as if, like, you know, it, it, you know how, how would I say it? It's like, <clears throat> and it's like don't just speak but act but in reality we started from unconscious action now speech is an add-on to the conscious action you know the healthiest way to perceive language and its role for the intelligence of this organism that we are is that it's a technology and we're using it People are not their names, but when they are called upon, they can. So prior to uh, the language that in some sense arose from the behavior of people, right? It, it's as if there, it's like the behavior of people before the words and subjects began linking with the objective events, right? It was as if there was a... Um, there was a sort of experiential conscious truth prior to us identifying uh, with a sort of subjective realm over the overlaid upon the objective realm. So anyways, the concept of God is the role of language in the minds of people and in some sense underneath their psyches, everybody's experiencing the existential scenario, which is pretty much where are we, like everybody begins like that. <coughs> All human psyche, like all human beings, probably have wondered. I mean, like, like you know, I think would, like this would be probably an incredible, even, like universal interview question to ask. Right? But it would be something like as if, how do you see the world? And everybody needs to have a sort of analysis on it if they are to have a sort of conceptual position in the story of reality. Right? So when it comes to direct experience, let's say direct experience of existence, this is the, where mysticism comes in and where I would say the mysticism in religion comes in too. 
right? There's this concept of the exoteric and the esoteric, right? <clears throat> and the esoteric implies it's suggesting the essence of something, like the depths of the ocean, and the exoteric is like the surface of the ocean. Now, to follow, let's say, a religious book by just what it says linguistically, that's the exoteric dimension. But the esoteric dimension to any sort of perception of a sort of system is that in some sense where is or how is the system held how is the activity occurring right it's like a general on a battlefield has to have the intelligence to be like okay what is happening on the battlefield yeah <laughs> just directly experiential language allowed memory to in some sense be noticed through self-consideration self-conception pretty much the moment we gave ourselves names then all everything could have a subjective representation that could associate to that central point right to that idea of self it's like this it's like there's no meaning, then there comes the center of, let's say, the, we have the self. And then this self can connect to various points. like really the study of existence is wondering about like the limitations of our visible information pretty much we're saying I mean to me like you know I feel science, science scientists overreact to the ideas of like in metaphysics transcendentalism right because the moment you acknowledge there's an unobservable universe then it's like anybody can imagine anything in a dark room it's like as, it's as if everything is theoretical subjectively until it can in some sense be represented objectively, right? There's a small crowd tonight. How did you get through, you know, giving a podcast, you know, about the concept of God with one for one viewer, right? <laughs> and I'll be like, you know, you know, sometimes one viewer could be enough, you know. Honestly, I, I don't know how far my voice is going to echo or whose ears it's going to echo. But on some level, I just want to see the might of a species attempting its greatest strategy before the curtains are pulled. You know, imagine, I'm, I'm thinking if my kids in the future, like this, in this hypothetical scenario, if, like if they were like, Father, how did you feel about having one viewer? You know, I'd be like, you know, it's like, it's like kids, you know, it's like, you know, uh, we're all one, you know, I'll, I'll make a oneness argument, and then technically if one person hears it, everybody has to. <laughs> or me knowing it, it's like everybody has It's very fascinating, like, you know, I really want to see, you know, 
the educational sector of this planet, all the, all the educational system, to in some sense begin acknowledging, you know, a sort of problem solving, you know, a problem solving approach where we're like, what are the visible and known variables? What are the invisible known and unknown variables? And what is the, in some sense, the invisible unknown variable? <coughs> you know, it's like, what are, you know, people writing their thesis on? And you know what's hilarious, right? A, a biggest clue that, you know, our species is currently being possessed is in a sort of possession phase of ideological possession is simply because new languages are not being created. It's as if, you know, you're, you get to live once on this planet in the form that you are and it's like at, that, at the same time, it's like you, you open your eyes and you realize everybody's trying to fit in to what the past expects of the future. Even society, even politicians, right? When politicians give debates, like you can totally see their, it's like in their mind how they have considered like the people, you know? <laughs> but everybody's trying to fit into the expectation of the past, not realizing that if you spend your lifetime copying the past, then what's the point of you being here, right? This is the tragedy of, of modernity, where people are trying to uh, artificially, you know, uh, it, it's like an art, it's like an, Im, it, it's like an emotional desire has made, you know, the psychology of the human being have an artificial acceptance to reach it, right? <clears throat> you know, it's like rather than us seeing new human beings, like how many religious people Right, they forget that they, you know, they have a life, and their life gets pulled into an idea. Right, to be honest, on this planet, right, we, you know, people don't wear that much hats anymore. Right, but like everybody's wearing a box on their head. Everybody has invisible boxes of language overlaid on their mind because really it has to do with how much of our experience allows us to engage the spectrum of manifestation that could be there. <clears throat> so the more it goes to the unknown to me the unknown is the moment the world is alive and we're saying there's an unobservable you know demanding view it's as if there is an unobservable life to the world right <clears throat> And really, divinity is the relationship of the invisible with the inconceivable. And humanity is the relationship of the visible with the, excuse me, the invisible with the visible. Our minds are invisibly being our bodies, and our bodies are visibly being our minds when we move. But when the mind that notices it is invisibly moving the visible body reaches a point where it sees, wait a minute, I am the viewer of phenomena, then what it could, what could, it's like that which is aware viewing phenomena is not the phenomena, you know what I'm saying? Like when somebody observes a tree, they're not inside the tree, like they're going to view. <laughs> you know? <coughs> What can 
I say about the inconceivable source of meaning? You know, the ancient yogis would say something so profound that to me, if, you know, it is one of the best kind of things I've heard from the ancient world. But they asked, you know, the, the sage, what can you do in this life? And the sage answered, there's only two things you can do. You can either trust it or distrust it. And the point of consciousness is to trust its journey through manifestation. And in some sense for us to recognize that this whole time, like a, a you know, like a character in a video game, you know, it's, it's like, it's like a character in a video game realizing it was never a pixelated character on a screen. It was a person sitting, you know, in front of a computer screen. And really what's going to happen for the human species, but it's, I'm predicting this like 3,600 years from now in my vision of civilization 2.0. Pretty much, we're going to become, or we're going to remember that we have been a sort of energetic presence that cannot be created or destroyed. And really what it is, is we are universal awareness. So what that means is like personalities, these are just how the snowball has rolled on the surface of the planet. You know, but what is moving the snowball is another sleep completely different it's like a hidden you know romance beyond you know matter I want to read some quotes right now you know more of an acknowledgement of, of the mystical dimension to me you know every person what what is a person a person is like you know let's say unknown attention looking out through biological eyes at a sort of knowable setting and then as a journey is conducted memories are sequentially accessed and so you can say memory is a way of uh, looking down uh, looking back at the staircase you've been climbing Technically, we stand over our memories if we can remember them. And so the human being is a system. It is a biochemical mechanism, right? And that means it is, it is serving a sort of function. And the function, let's say through <coughs> Darwinning, we have come to the conclusion that it is survival, right? But in some sense, survival of what? You see, it's like in the middle of, of, of the objective animalist uh, evolution of the animal, where like, wait a minute, what do we do with the mind though? You know, <laughs> you know it's like neuroscientists are baffled, you know, at how we can connect personality to neural movement. It's like we've painted over a, a, a changing canvas, and when the canvas changes, we think our artwork is alive, but it's just it's a changing canvas. Sargadat Maharaj, learn to live without self-concern. For this you, for this you must know your own, for this you must know your own true being as indomitable, fearless, ever victorious. Once you know with absolute certainty that nothing can trouble you but your own imagination, you come to disregard your desires and fears, concepts and ideals, and live by truth alone. It's 
another way of saying like how we're being present surpasses our, our conceptual entitlement as an entity in the realm and when we can discriminate between the nature of the outer realms and the nature of the inner realms then there comes the abidance and it's another way of saying like you know we don't think about our heart it, it just beats you know we don't think about our lungs you know they just breathe you know <clears throat> it's like the inhale exhale is involuntary but why is it that we're suddenly conscious like we can move our hands but we can't stop our heart you see what i'm saying like it's like a certain it's like a majority of what we are being as a being it's like because we're being biological and natural it's in a sort of automated rhythmic relationship with uh, with reality So what, I, what I'm predicting will happen in the future is that just like somebody after repeating something over a period of time, let's say you, you, were, you, know, you, uh, you were a child back in medieval times and you know, let's say your father was a general who had died on battle in battle in the battlefield where people fought with swords and shields. <clears throat> and so imagine you as this kid every day of your life you just went into the forest after you, you had completed the tasks of the day and just practiced on trees like how to use a sword <clears throat> eventually after some time you would have so many memories so many variations so many experiential versions of, it, of that moment where it's as if you attain some mastery and the human psychology is going through a sort of repetition it is cyclical in nature. So, in some sense, that when something becomes second nature is another way of saying we don't have to think about it. It's like somebody who's been driving a vehicle for 10 years. It's like after the 10 years, they don't have to even have an idea. Like the person could be driving and could be at like, let's say you're a trucker, you know, and you, you've, you've been driving every day to a point where you have mastered you know, like the car's movement, the vehicle's movement. Right, so it's like the whole truck feels like your body when you're driving, <clears throat> and so as you're as you're driving, it's like the, the it becomes second nature. So imagine you're a trucker that's listening to a podcast, right? So you begin, so you find the capacity to bring in new dimensions once you have mastered the old ones, right? So similarly, I am saying this thing that we are uh, is uh, animating as a human psychology in the future, we will reach a, point, a mastery point of it where it will become second nature so it's another way of saying uh, from a sort of unconscious uh, synchronized movement of nature we came to a conscious you know a disharmonious state and then from this we're going to a sort of conscious uh, synchronization of the realm it's another way of saying when the attention feels it can be the whole moment but then it doesn't fear how the contents inside the moment change life is that something is moving you. <clears throat> something is happening that no human idea can capture. It's so beautiful. It's like, you know, imagine looking at like being a nature photographer and seeing like a wild lion just <clears throat> doing a roar at noon or something. It's like to me, I feel like I have a, 
a sort of Steve Irvin fascination for, for the psychological position of the meaning of reality. You know what I'm saying? And to me, it's like, it's like, it's like a, you know, in, in for Pokemon, it was like a wild Pokemon appeared. It's like, you know, the person's born in a wild world has appeared, a wild cosmic situation. And so, if we can surpass ideological acceptance, uh, ideological uh, worship, uh, we reach a sort of position where man resets his story of the world, and that's when knowledge and exploration happens. <clears throat> you know, it's just an ability to know your limitations, and when they say know your limits, that means get a sense of uh, limitless. You know, human beings, like even us being capable psychologically due to language being in a dualistic system, like the only way we can say that we are temporary beings is if we have the contrast of the opposing view, which is another way of saying without the consideration of the concept of eternity, the concept of temporary doesn't make sense. It's a duality. You know, the world is believing in one side of a coin that's spinning in the middle of nowhere. <clears throat> you know, that's the that's the poetic, you know, let's say freestyle rap or dance off between the materialists and the immaterialists, right? When I look at these like you know, debates between theists and atheists on YouTube. To me, it's like they're break dancers, and they you know, they each have their own different style. You know? And to me, you know, there there came a time where I stopped personifying. Like when I heard, like, here, let me say it this way: <clears throat> before, when I heard language, I was like, "How is the person saying that language?" Like. It's like now I've reached a point where when I listen to something, it's all about <clears throat> how does it translate into a film behind my mind? Because I could remember a film way more e uh, easily than in some sense sentence structure, you know? <clears throat> you know, it's, it's like, that's the power. What, what was it? It's like an image is like a thousand words. Life is actually and a, a sort of virtual experiential event of the conditions of existence in these existential conditions we have awakened and we have started off just like an inventor creates a prototype you can say the psychological position of the human race in 2022 it's the prototype up to this point and the species must have the capacity to to in some sense just like an eagle can fly from a branch and look at the sky that's like the solution to ending all wars, right? It's it's like pretty much this is you could say Mr. Witten's strategy, <clears throat> not into bringing global peace but global advancement because peace is subjective, based on how every person defines it. But advancement is a movement towards the infinite of all minds. <clears throat> you know, it's as if we 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 stop or uh, believing that truth is outside of us and for a moment we ask ourselves you know what could God be on a rock where there's stuff moving on it it's like all the movement is being attributed is God here do you see it's like why should there be creatures moving on a rock in the middle of nowhere that is the divinity that's the divine factor of the existential scenario whether you want to keep personified through cultural frameworks of you know ideology or not you know it, it, it's as if like the coach of a soccer field <clears throat> I don't know why but I actually think I might have the potential to be a great football coach you know
It's just the fascination for why there's anything happening at all. This is why I think when we are children, all of us, whoever's listening, when we're children, it's as if we, because we don't have memories to filter the experience of perception, the child is just like an, an explorer of a new world, right? When, when we forget we are an explorer of a new world, we get defined by the systems, or in some sense, the language used. You know, in, in an episode of mine, I spoke about the language wars. And what I meant by that is that pretty much brains, from let's say a material, from a secular perspective, it's like, you know, the brain and the skull is like a jar, the brain is there, and there's liquid around it, right? And then it's like how the brain happens is being the free will of the individual, right? <clears throat> it's very hard to say free will without a brain is like, then what is moving what? playing video games it's like we are being the souls of cyber lifetimes <clears throat> in video games in certain video games the character respawns like the character gets defeated by some enemy or opponent and then it respawns from a previous checkpoint presence of a world happening in so many unknown ways that the privilege of conscious life is to see greatness not to just be it but to see it happen that feeling that feeling that the impossible moved made the chess chess move first before the possible you know that's <coughs> the ethos of you can say an advanced civilization for me um yeah, I'll probably dedicate more episodes to Civilization 2.0. Anybody who's been listening to these Mr. Within talks, it all comes down to this. This is my magnum opus. Civilization 2.0 is what I'm trying to, you know, uh, I would like, I would love history to remember me for. Anyways. I want to read a bunch of mystical quotes, you know, why not? Let me, let me be that guy on the internet who read, you know, ancient mystical quotes. You know. <laughs> <coughs> you know, I feel some some people viewing this podcast right now, they're like, this guy's sharing, you know, you know, dozens of in, mystical, ancient, enlightening quotes, you know. It's like, okay, maybe I'll subscribe. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so I will 
take the viewer's attention into the uh, into a cold tunnel of you know various uh, yogis and one who is very notable and I would say which has had you know very profound influence I, I would say directly on Western culture like you know they're 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 you know how would I say a lot of people from the West went to see this guy I'm gonna read quotes from. Ramushi Ramana Marshi says, At present, we are conscious of ourselves as a set of adjuncts with objects. With, excuse me. At present, we are conscious of ourselves as a set of adjuncts with object, knowing consciousness in which our attention seemingly move away from the self towards the object with separation between knowing subject and knowing object. In self-inquiry, we withdraw our attention. In self-inquiry, we, with, we withdraw our attention from thoughts and objects so that attention rests in self without any oscillation. To posit our attention in this state is the aim of self-inquiry. that there's a relationship with how an object is knowing it's conscious and the way that happens is like the attention and you know what he's saying he's Ramana Marsh is pretty much saying the moment we move in this world we become a dualistic entity subjectively and Sri Ramana Marsh is saying if you for a second find the capability to notice that the idea of you prior to the free will of animating it is being observed. That means that what is looking out through your eyes, dear listener, is unknown. And nobody in history cared to notice this variable. It's like we can have the greatest you know, meaning to life and then plus an, uh, uh, the unknown X variable, right? As long as the unknown exists, it's like certainty is just, you know, a snapshot of a changing film, worldly film. Sri Ramana Maharshi says, turning the mind inward is done by practice and dispassion, and that succeeds only gradually. The mind, having been so long a cow, accustomed to graze stealthily on other states is not easily confined to her stall. However much her keeper tempts her with luscious grass and fine fodder, she refuses the first time, then she takes a bit, but her innate tendency to stray away asserts itself, and she slips away on being repeatedly tempted by the owner. She accustoms herself to the stall. Finally, even let loose, she would not stray away. Similarly with the mind, it, it, if once it finds its inner happiness, it will not wander outward. You know, guys, another metaphor for what he's saying is that I remember seeing this Facebook photo of this elephant in a developing country where the elephant, the owner, had connected a rope to the leg of the elephant and the rope was connected to a chair. Do you know what I'm saying? That means it was connected to a plastic chair. That means the elephant had the strength to move it, but it was psychologically conditioned to feel it can't. And then literally how it's done is these guys would go and put, uh, connect like a rope to the leg of the elephant, a very strong rope, and connect the rope to like a metal, you know, some chunk of, let's say a metal column sticking out of the ground or something, you know, <laughs> right? or connected to some tree or something and the elephant could not move 
right. The elephant could not move and it would try, try, try until it would suddenly have to adjust to its environment. So similarly, Sri Ramana Maharshi is saying, just like that elephant who is attached to something that it cannot detach itself from or it cannot get away from, like when it's in a scenario, it cannot just escape. After a long time, it begins accepting that scenario. But what Sri Ramana Maharshi is saying, if you wonder who is accepting that scenario, you will eventually return to the unknown. And once you experience that, you reach a point where it's like when it's like this. It's like just like how you know you're a, uh, how you. It's like just like how everybody knows their mind, in which they people say my body or they say like my hand or, or you know you know what I'm saying. <laughs> like it's like we, we 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 speak about the body as if the mind owns it, right? The idea of us is the owner of the body. The idea of ours is subjective. Either way, you know, there's a quote from Voltaire, let me find it. There's this quote ascribed to Voltaire, where he says, Voltaire, uh, you know, has this, you know, let's say this French philosopher has this very unique quote where he says, if there were no God, it would be necessary to invent him, right? Because of the intensity, like literally the title of this episode answers this, but where it's the intensity of the meaningless circumstances. It's like we're in a video game where the quests are being set by the character rather than the character already having the quest out there. Voltaire has this quote where he says, I have never made but one prayer to God, a very short one. O oh Lord, make my enemies ridiculous, and God granted it. <laughs> so. I would say the idea is simply this. That there is as many views to ideologically, conceptually, subjectively, sensory-wise. There's as many different views to truth as if truth is the center of the circle and every person born is a unique angle to the center of the circle.
you know, the mystery of where or what is the central source to consciousness, what is the governing factor, is it even interpretable or even conceivable for the human consciousness to be capable of defining itself, you know, it, it's like as much of a bizarre thing where we say, you know, the mind created the concept of the body, you know, to acknowledge the body, right, but then we ask ourselves, wait a minute, if the mind created the body, then did the mind create the mind, and we see no, and this is where the attribute of the, I would say the attribute of the soul becomes significant, where the person is like, wait a minute, what is the nature of my eyes, right, Sri Nisargadak Maharaj, he has this next level question, guys, this question, when I read it, it gave me goosebumps, he said, are you an entity, question, and he's saying have you ever wondered are you even what you are thinking you are or is there something more right is it could it be that it is in freedom was in the room before the illusion could lay you know claim to anything you know it's like contentment with the unknown is the beginning of inner peace for me this is why the species has to change the ethos of the future generations has to be one where it has to be patient and benevolent you know that's literally what we need to get through you know let's say <clears throat> the, 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 you know the remnants of savageness before the truly advanced civilized being and civilization the advanced community before the advanced communicators activate Right, to me, it's like we're a, we're a species that is in slumber, right, or hibernation, right? We're like the might of an advanced civilization, just sleeping, you know, having not yet awakened to itself. <clears throat> and, uh, It's like the human civilization 1.0, the best way I could say it, from, you know, is that uh, it's a sleeping lion. <coughs> and when it wakes up, it's roar. When it wakes up, that's the advanced communicators role in history. And then when it roars, that's the pilots of consciousness in the future generations. At least I have, you know, I've authorized in my universe the possibility that there will be children born so advanced that all the things that are problems to us and tragedies and things we're, you know, ex extracting emotional suffering from, it's like their minds will be so advanced where it's as if they wouldn't need to think in, it's like the ways that we're thinking now they're going to already know how to be, right? <coughs> It's like there's a tango between genetics and, and you know, a, 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 a cultural historic psychology. Anyways, guys, thanks for listening. Uh, in this episode, my major attempt, pretty much, this was my contribution, where I, w I was like, okay, you know, there's so many levels to acknowledging something, just like an object can be looked at from different angles, a subject can be looked at different angles, but in the attempt to consider, like, the human mind, not only did it consider, like, where did a person come from, from people, could the universe come from people, come, come from a person, right, or the concept of the king, that there was a king of a kingdom, and who is the king of the, you know, all of existence in the world, right, so I could totally see, you know, a sort of archetype you know <clears throat> a blueprint to the development of a state of mind that could even acknowledge the concept of God right <clears throat> because the question comes what was the revelation to you know there's this mystery in theology where our souls are, are you know are, are technically you know it's like the emanations of God right <clears throat> they're like in their God's you know it's, it's like technically theologically man was made of clay and God's breath was was, was in some sense became you know uh, imbued you know animation to this clay right 
<coughs> and what I mean by this, <coughs> what I mean by this is simply that it's the divine will, right? The concept of the soul is that it, it's like it started from God and it returns to God, right? So, <coughs> in, in going through this notion, it would be, um, man, where was I going with this? Pretty much, you know, this position. Where man's relationship with the cosmos was also a reflection through itself, you know. <clears throat> it's as if the God made in uh, man's image is memory and the, God, and the man made in God's image is in some sense like probably the soul or the unknown witness. We shouldn't fear our minds, we should discover it, we should reach a point where we realize 8 million human beings, or let's say civilized human beings, that's equivalent to like 8 billion like master musicians and every person's DNA, it's as if you have eyes, you know, that the uh, world has never seen, and this is the power of honesty. Honesty is another way of saying trusting the original, or authenticity is another way of saying trusting the original. The original is effortless. Just that everybody begins realizing, everybody just notices that there's this giant event, colossal event happening. The destiny of the universe is so much bigger than the human being that the moment we give a story to the cosmos, it like surpasses. <clears throat> we become ants, you know, or, or we suddenly like, you know, ants on, on a table. Let's say an ant on a table became like, you know, a human sitting on the shoulder of a giant cosmic event. That's a ridiculous metaphor, but, you know, I think that, you know, sitting on the giant's shoulder, we are, we are conscious of the cosmos. We're literally sitting on the shoulder, like the cosmos is an unconscious movement, and we are a conscious movement, and our unconscious movement due to our organism and this instrument that we are, uh, this technology that we are, <coughs> It's like it's limited, right? So it's as if it, like the life of the cosmos is the giant where the conscious life of the human being is taking place. Even scholars would say, some scholars have said that there's two worlds. There is a world that began from the moment you were born and the moment you will die. <clears throat> and a world that in some sense begins.
that is pretty much the date on your, let's say, you know, on your gravestone. And then there was a world here before you, and there will be a world here after you. And for me, somehow the game of, you know, the, the life of the self became a bit boring. And I was like, in some sense, what would be an achievement of the species? That means that's really, you know, uh, what the, the greatest intelligence on the planet should strive towards. You know, it's like, you know, it's as if well, we are the solutions to the problems that we can conceive. Right. There's a great ability there. Any person's mind, like, I feel the future generations are going to be so fearless that they will, in some sense, feel like, you know, technically, they won't be problem solvers. Because all problems will be attempted. The effort would be endless until their solution arises. You know, there's, there's a beautiful poetry to life, which is another way of saying, where is it going? Where is the, the the human species? What what is it walking towards, right? And I am saying we we have reached a point in history where if we ignore that we are multidimensional beings, it's being dishonesty for the ability of the psyche to identify more than duality, which is both a cosmological conditioning and also a linguistic conditioning. That means it's like, you know, there was the absence of light and there was the presence of light. That's where the first duality began. Yeah. <clears throat> it's as if, imagine, like, before there was a fish under the ocean, there was, like, a cell. And imagine you were a cell and light came and light left. Light came. It would be as if, like, two states of mind is being, uh, you know, the creature's being conditioned in two states. A state of when it gets dark, there's fear. When there's light, there's joy. What is heaven? heaven is all light what is a evil we call it darkness do you see what i'm saying it's like the cosmological position has an influence on our interpretation of even you know the stories of our cultures right it's like there's something you know inseparable between how the sub uh, how a subjective self inside an object uh, excuse me how an objective self is like simulating a subjective world that it's like the instantaneity the possibility it's like we are creatures that don't only have an ability to see when when our eyes are open a person can close their eyes and remember what they ate yesterday and they can see that means take that in imagination is seeing with your eyes closed right it's another way of saying you don't need light to be able to uh, visualize right you do need an initial, let's say, exposure of light, you know, it's like there has to be, like, you literally, it's hilarious, the idea of the human being is the separation of, like, one singular natural event into a self and the world, and it, enlightenment is another way of saying when the self consciously realizes it's part of the consciousness of the world, it's another way of saying, uh, you know, the mind of the universe has been simultaneously taking place as your mind has. And so when the idea that you are, you are an idea in some sense vanishes through the recognition that an instantaneous moment of attention and energy being some, just an instant of, uh, in, it's like an instantaneous moment, uh, there is no time. Right, the timeless truth of being is like an instantaneity that has no partner or comparison, as if truth is the instantaneity of being. Right, and in some sense, the stories of man that search for truth are, in some sense, the simulations or the movements. It's like more than it's like after you have more than two memories, it's like you can be anything pretty much. Or let's say you have more than three memories, you can simulate in any way, like the, the visualization of the begins. Right, if they see it's like Jacques Lacan's mirror effect, the child looked in the <clears throat> mirror and noticed that okay, I'm that's my reflection. Now, the child's the, the next kind of effect would be in some sense the child being able, let's call it Mr. Within's memory effect. <clears throat> the child can discriminate between three memories, three separate memories, three separate events, and can pinpoint it in time. Time is technically you know, one of the founding, uh, uh, one of the touchstones of uh, one of one of the pillars of consciousness. I don't know how to say it. It's just very fascinating, the human position. You know, it's as if, it's, it's, am I in God's eyes or is God in my eyes? 
Shankar in some sense uh, why did Swami Krishnananda this very in my view you know, indirectly liberated sage <coughs> He said one of the most fascinating sentences I've heard about God, where he said, God, a, a religion is God remembering himself. That means what the soul is started from an original that cannot be. It's as if the cause, it's like the effect is the, you know, aftermath of the cause. And poetically, like, or theologically, the soul is the aftermath of God. It's very fascinating. <clears throat> there's a life in front of our eyes, and there's a life behind our eyes, and it's like two wings of a multidimensional bird, you know, that if they are synchronized, great flights can happen. You know, we are pilots of our attention in the void. A species that still fears has not recognized the unknown is bigger than what our fears could mean. You know, it's like this is this is at least my way where I, I found some sort of fearlessness I could extract from the world where it was pretty much like, okay, who is placing the banner of identity in the present? It's as if there's something happening here and we have entered like conscious travelers in an unconscious world. <clears throat> and as conscious travelers, we are just self-absorbed. And so it's like when we see beyond that self you become you suddenly wonder about not the presence of your own mind not just the presence of the mind of others but the presence of the mind of the universal sector why in this part of the cosmos anything is happening at all this is the significance it's as if, it's, it's, it's as if like I, I sometimes think of extraterrestrials like advanced extraterrestrial civilizations were like flying past earth they'd be like oh look at you know what it's grown in this garden, you know, creatures killing themselves over, you know, abstract desire. <laughs> it's like we would be adorable to states of mind that surpass reality because we're so in, uh, entranced by it. guys um, I'm just gonna read a couple of things a couple of quotes and end this off but I, I feel I've successfully shared a lot of the you know inner visions uh, <coughs> as if the inventions for this talk have been made so I feel content so I'm gonna read these quotes for me. Krishna. 
he says, give up everything to him with a capital H. Resign yourself to him and your troubles and sorrows will be at an end. Then you will come to know that everything is done by his will alone. <clears throat> As if Ramakrishna is saying the divine was in the room first. This is why we honor the effect honor it honors its cause of its choosing to see its end. There's a man by the name of Muru Ganar. He says, if you refrain from looking at this, that, or any other object, then by that overpowering look into absolute being, you become yourself the boundless space of pure awareness, which alone is real being. Papaji says, if there is peace in your mind, you will find peace with everybody. If your mind is agitated, you will find agitation everywhere. So first find peace within and you will see this inner peace reflected everywhere else. You are this peace. As if we have not been the suffering, we have been the ability of the peace. We are the, we are the living in the void. You know, it's as if we are that which is moving the now. You see that this is an incredible divine position. It's like an animal has become a representative of a universal sector by the mere ability of its attention to notice it. She says, for those who live in self, as the beauty devoid of thought, there is nothing which should be thought of. That which should be adhered to is only the experience of silence, because in that supreme state, nothing exists to be attained other than oneself. That's it, guys. That's, that's the advanced, most advanced state of the mind. The mind, due to its fear, is separated from reality. But if fear doesn't translate into an emotional, ideological sort of story of love, but it becomes as if the rebel, the retaliation or the, the rebellion of the temporary, and in some sense the mystery of the unknown, the rebellion, the conscious rebellion, you know, of a species, you know, in the emptiness of, you know, in, in outer space. You know, people say they go to outer space, but technically the planet is in outer space, you know. That means if I was, if I got into an argument with an astronaut, <clears throat> and the astronaut's like, I've been in outer space, I'll be like, buddy, the planet's in outer space. You know? <laughs> technically, us being on a planet is being in outer space. And of course, I'm saying it's humorous. To me, I think one of the greatest things, I just hope it, you know, this happens. A part of me feels it will someday, but I would love to interview astronauts, you yeah. You know, imagine NASA was like, why not coll collaborate, you know, with a, you know, a, you know, philosopher podcast or <laughs> It's hilarious, at night we seek the light, you know, and when, let's say you've been walking in a very sunny des desert, you just seek the shade. We experience suffering, we want to escape it, and if we were to experience joy of a similar simulated level, we would, we would not be able to hold it, right? It's as if it's the question of greatness, you know. <coughs> now, what's his name? Uh, Shakespeare says some people are born great, 
Some people achieve greatness. And some people have greatness thrust upon them. And you know, I will tell you, uh, we have reached such an interesting point in history where the requirement to march towards an advanced civilization the point where <clears throat> you know the sheep uh, have realized they are a lion wearing wool and 2022 I declared it since 2020 but I'm saying the era of advanced communication has begun which is another way of saying the era of the greatest performances of the minds of human beings you know is going to happen <clears throat> the, you know, the best thing we can say about the future is it's going to be impressive. <laughs> you know, they're like, you know, if somebody was like, how is, how is it? Imagine like, you know, I had a time machine and I went and saw my future self and I came back and somebody was like, yo, you know, how was it? How was the experience of seeing your own future self? You know, <clears throat> your own future. I'd be like, well, I was so impressed by my future self. You know, I'd be like, man. <laughs> You know, who knew everything had such potential? You know, we have such a potential where I would say the enlightenment of, uh, uh, let's say, an absolute archetype would in some sense be a transition beyond the duality of the Purusha and Prakriti. Purusha and Prakriti are pretty much <coughs> the sword and shield of an inconceivable being. In the battle of Samsara, It's very fascinating. The, the poet Hoffa says, why do you prefer to crawl through life when you were born with wings? <clears throat> Shakespeare says greatness is thrust upon, you know, so some people it's thrust upon them. Now we have reached the point in history, and I'll finish the point, that greatness is being thrust upon the living. Right? That means that our ancestors are watching and the unborn future generations are watching and now is the greatest performance. You know, now is when the lion can roar because the forest is here. Right? And we have appeared, you know, in, in a very advanced position. All It's like we have seen anarchy from the beginning. We, we evolved from anarchy. Right? <clears throat> the word cosmos just means order. That means it's like we started to organize the meaning. And so Mr. Rithan is saying to the world, the potential of our species is so beyond our belief systems that are just, you know, uh, programmed in duality, that, you know, it's like wonder about your eyes, you know, <coughs> that were here before you could not be. An advanced civilization awaits, you know. The, 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 now, you know, this podcast of mine, it's, it's, it's another way of saying my heart's trying to archaically revive the legend of the castles and the, the kingdoms of the sky, you know. Shall the species, shall the species advance? like the invisible pilot of a visible infinity. 
and mastery comes with recognition of the, it's as if once the pilot pilots the plane to its destination, then in some sense the pilot steps out of their airplane. Our life beyond categories, language, and memory, there's, 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 a, there's a life beyond our eyes, you know, and it is waiting for us. Namaste.